All right, what is going on my lovely ladies and gentlemen? Today I'm going to try something a little bit new. I'm branching out into somewhat different topics. Now, potential like, things that obviously I still think are interesting, but they may not have to do with games in general. Uh, I am going so from now on I'm going to stop being a lazy little asshole cuz Previously, I had been putting down like timestamps for when I start talking about things. I mentioned what I was going to talk about in the video, uh, and I'm going to start doing that again because you know I don't want you to sit around and just be like, "Is he ever going to talk about anything I'm interested in, or is he just not going to shut up?" Uh, I want you to know, you know, if you want to skip to a topic that you are the only topic in this uh, discussion that you're interested in, I want you to be able to go straight through it, even though I would prefer. If you listen to everything I have to say and potentially discuss it a little bit, I do not blame you for not being interested in a topic. That's never fair to blame somebody or think less of somebody because they're not interested in the same things you are. So, what I'm going to talk about. I recently read a book called Starship Troopers and I just wanted to kind of, I don't even know why I'm actually, <laughs> now that I think about it, probably shouldn't, but whatever. I want to discuss the difference from the book and the movie and then not, I'm not going to go hugely in depth with that. But I also, uh, I recently went and saw Captain America Civil War. And I want to talk about not that movie, but I want to talk about Star Wars. Because one of the previews was for a Star Wars movie. And it's not a main Star Wars movie. And I'm going to talk about why I'm very excited about that. Then I want to talk about the NBA Finals. Now wait, wait, don't close the video yet, just wait. <laughs> See, because I, even I know, I... On uh, Twitter, I don't follow a huge amount of people because, like, when you follow too many people, it starts to get so cluttered that it's like you're gonna miss 99% of what's even there unless you spend like half your day just scrolling down and looking at everything. So I try to keep it to things that are more or less kind of announcement based rather than entertainment based for myself. Um, and but even then, despite that, my entire feed was still filled. With NBA Finals stuff post Game Seven, uh, after the you know the game was over, the series was over, and all that shit. So I know people are probably incredibly sick of talk about the NBA Finals, but I am I'm actually going to relate it to fighting games or just kind of competitiveness in general. I'm not gonna talk about you know like specific players and their performance. I'm not gonna be talking about you know like numbers like oh man this dude's average scoring stuff was amazing. I'm not gonna talk about that at all. I am going to relate it to fighting games, so bear with me. And then the last thing I want to talk about is Mighty Number no. 9 and the catastrophe that it is. So those are the things that I'm going to talk about. So let's hop right into it. Starship Troopers, not going to discuss this very much. I just found it incredibly interesting that uh, my initial exposure to it was through the movie. Now, if you've seen the movie, you know it's a comedic thing. I mean, it better be comedic. It has Neil Patrick Harris. It has Denise Richards. I th was Michelle Rodriguez in that? I mean, it's a movie that features female space marines. It's basically like a requirement for a movie like that to have Michelle Rodriguez, but I can't actually remember if she was in it. Anyway, point being, it was kind of a more comedic-based film. And then you actually read the book. There's no comedy in the book. The book is very serious. The book is very... It has a very significant point behind it regarding war and whatnot. And the reason why I actually wanted to talk about it is that going through school... So I've always been a big reader. Ever since I was little, I have always read books. One of my earliest memories of negative emotion comes from my being in second grade, I want to say. And we were able to... And our teacher took us to the school library and said, Pick out any one book to read and you need to write a book report on it. So we're all looking around, people are picking out their books. The book I pick out, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. Now, that's a little bit above a second grader's reading level, let's be perfectly honest. But again, I'm a very big reader at this point in time. I've read a lot of books. I haven't read anything as complicated as that was, and honestly, I can't say whether or not I would have been able to properly understand it at that point in time because I never got around to it. My teacher had to approve the books to make sure they were appropriate, and so I took it up to her, and she said, no, this is above your reading level, find something more appropriate. She didn't even let me try, she didn't even let me attempt to understand it, to read it, to improve my reading capability uh, by picking out a book that is more complicated than it really should be, 
And so that I, I've always been a big reader. But going through school, I hated almost every book we read. I really did not enjoy them. I mean, sure, they're considered literary classics. They have points of discussion behind them. And that's one of the biggest things that kind of needs to exist if you're going to have an educational book. But I feel like if you want somebody to properly learn something, they have to be into it as well. You can't just have this purely scholarly interest in... I mean, you can't... I'm, interest is a false word right here. You can't purely base... think somebody's going to learn about something from a scholarly pursuit. They have to be interested in it as well. And that is exactly what I was not. They wanted me to learn from this. They wanted me to care about it. But there was nothing to care about. There was nothing that made me invested in the book. So then I read Starship Troopers. Expecting something along the lines of the movie. Because I hadn't read any discussion about it. I didn't know the movie had basically damn near nothing to actually do with the book. So then I read the book. And I thought, damn. This is actually a really pointed example of like just war in general... Uh, what it really means to be engaged in a war. How, and these are things that I think, especially in America, given, you know, there's been a lot of wars in our history, something we should learn about, something we should think about. And so I'm sitting here thinking, like, why? This is the kind of book that they should be having us learn from. Not, oh, hey, look at this literary style that this person is writing because we all care so much about proper uh, grammar and utilization of the English language as we can see from the internet in general. People care so much about writing excellently, right? Nobody gives a shit about that. Then you have stuff like... Actually, that's basically all that it was. There was very... I guess you could argue Ender's Game was also along the same lines, and that was one of the books that I did enjoy uh, reading in high school. But again, those were so few and far between, and I'm just kind of sitting here thinking like, this is the kind of book that you should get kids into because at this point in time especially if you're in high school they can understand it they get it they're starting to be exposed to this part of the world now granted uh my time in high school was fairly soon after 9 11 and was uh you know we obviously we had the war in the middle east the ongoing well, still ongoing but it was very much a bigger deal back then, so it would have been even more poignant of a thing to do at the point in time, and it just, it feels like they pick the safe, boring choices in order to try and teach uh, the lessons they want to teach, and I think that's the wrong way to go about education in the incorrect way, and because, again, something that is potentially controversial obviously does potentially promote conflict within a classroom promotes arguments that teachers may not want to deal with may not want to have to handle may not be capable of handling so you have to analyze it from a variety of standpoints and understand that you know like maybe you don't want that level of spirited discussion even though i think it's something that everybody should engage in and so everybody should learn how to deal with it because anybody that's been in an argument at any point in time understands how badly some people including yourselves when you start out i mean obviously when you start out you're not going to be masterful at handling argumentative tactics you're not going to be <laughs> the masterful debater <laughs> the master debater um you're not going to be amazing at it you're not going to flow everything well i still remember when i was in high school six i mean not high school middle school sixth grade history class i think that was the first time i had like a legitimate debate and i was doing really well and i like killed the opposition destroyed it and that felt good it felt good to me my teacher was impressed as well my teacher like my teacher was generally silent throughout the whole thing and at the time you know like during certain points of my argument i could actually see her like thinking about it and considering stuff and during numerous moments she actually said things like oh that's interesting good point things like that which she hadn't really been doing with anybody else so that gave me a certain satisfaction, a certain amount of pride. But then because of how well I was doing, she allowed the class to engage with me instead of the person that I was, uh, you know, arguing the opposing point to. And the class, one person, one person killed my point with one sentence. And I sat there and I had nothing. I had nothing to say. I couldn't think of anything. I was stumped. And all I could say was god damn it i hate you <laughs> that's all i said 
And I just went and I sat down. That was it. Right at that moment, I was done. It was over. I had nothing left. And I went and I sat down. And that person, that smug motherfucker, was not actually smug because he was one of the nicest. He was a good friend of mine. And he's one of the nicest people I knew. And so he wasn't even smug about it. He was just, I mean, he was obviously just kind of like trying to promote my own thought process, trying to help me out, trying to, um, he wasn't looking for, you know, the smug satisfaction of putting someone down or appearing superior to somebody else. And he even came up after class and he talked to me and he said, hey, this is what, you know, remember what I said, this is the counterpoint to that, this is what I was hoping you would go for, very nice dude, wonderful dude, but still, at the, I can very distinctly remember that moment, because I felt so shitty about being ruined by a single sentence, when it comes to arguments, and I think it's a huge, I think it's a very important thing to be able to argue properly, um, to be to acknowledge what argumentative tactics are. I had to take a college level English class, which wasn't even a requirement now that I think about it. I think it was like three classes further along than what was actually required for general education stuff, uh, where they actually taught specific argumentative things, things like the ad hominem attacks, uh, the red herring arguments, you know, things like that that actually tell you what they describe what people will generally try to do in an argument what good things to do are what bad things to do are and this is a class that probably 95 percent of people in the american educational system will never experience they'll never know about that they'll never hear about that and that blew my mind when i actually thought about it like it took me this long to get in the class with concepts this important and it isn't even required and so again, just kind of spinning it all back to where it started, I feel like having those level of spirited discussions where obviously you want somebody capable of toning down potential emotion, um, you want somebody being able to mediate correctly and properly, and honestly, let's there are probably a lot of teachers that aren't really capable of that. Um, but that being said, I feel like that's a necessary step in somebody's growth as a person. And it's something that isn't, that we kind of bypass in general and i think you know books like starship troopers would be wonderful to accommodate that life lesson that everybody should learn that got kind of serious there for a second so let's move on to star wars what's it called rogue one is that what it's called the new movie it's a side story in the star wars universe they had a preview for it uh before again captain america civil war and i was very excited about it not because i think the movie itself looks amazing now, it's pretty damn awesome that they are actually taking a quote-unquote risk with a female lead. There are not a lot of things, not even, you know, not including books and video games and movies. A lot of those types of things are not willing to make a female the lead character. So, by default, that's really awesome to see that this iconic franchise is willing to take that chance now obviously in regard to the last star wars you kind of have i can't even remember her name i was so i cared so little about what basically constituted a remake of the first star wars movie of a new hope that i was just like ah whatever i don't even care um but you can kind of argue that that had a female lead but she wasn't introduced she was she kind of shared the spotlight right whereas rogue one looks like it is purely based around this one female so you got to give them a little bit of credit toward being willing to do that and again being the iconic franchise it is kind of hopefully pushing the progress along and seeing more of that happen um but just the fact that it's expanding out of the mainline series because i don't know how many books i don't read a lot of the star wars books mostly because there's so goddamn many of them and i have a limited amount of time and i would prefer to read something that i can finish but there are tons of Star Wars books, Star Wars stories, other media in general, and the universe is so rich and diverse and full of possibilities that I feel like they've been making a mistake all this time, only bothering with the main line, you know, Jedi versus Sith thing, and tie, you know, the Luke Skywalker saga, and the Anakin Skywalker saga, and all that, I feel like there's a lot of untapped potential in the Star Wars universe that they can utilize and grow and really turn into something that, you know, kind of the same thing as Marvel's doing with their comic universe. 
and it can be amazing it can be wonderful and it, it, this is the first step in seeing that happen and i'm really excited for it and i hope that it goes incredibly well and we continue to see further progress about it because i feel like at the end of the line my finish line personally is to see another goddamn single player knights of the old republic not that mmo bullshit i don't play mmos i don't like mmos but you give me a goddamn single player knights of the old republic story please if enough goes well then maybe they'll think about doing another one give it to me i need it man so badly i need it ah even still like the CGI trailers that Bioware has come up with throughout their time as a gaming company have been amazing. They've been worthy of a cinematic experience all of their own. This includes the Mass Effect trailers, uh, the Old Republic trailer. Actually, I think those are the only ones, right? That they've because that's all they've really done ever since they got acquired by EA. Well, obviously, Mass Effect started directly before they got acquired by EA, but I don't think the original Mass Effect had a CGI trailer. Mass Effect Two did. Mass Effect Three had a couple. And by uh, the Old Republic had like five or six. They had a lot, and there's probably even more that I haven't seen due to like you know numerous expansions to the game and whatnot. Um, but every single time I've seen one of those, I'm sitting there and basically thinking, "Fuck, I wish they'd make a movie like this." <laughs> Maybe we'll see it because I feel like a world like Star Wars would really do what would excel in a CGI medium. And special effects are not the only thing we, you know, like, they will make it look good and whatnot. It's, I think uh, a properly done CGI thing could even be potentially better than a live-action version of the movie because it allows so much more flexibility for physics-based things. And it also kind of maintains a certain flow because there's always a, sort, a certain amount of discontinuity between seeing something that is a live action stunt and then it flickers over into like you know a cgi thing real quick when they do something extreme that a stunt man may not be possible of doing or that physics may not be possible of uh handling properly and you can generally know if you're looking closely enough you can notice that and it kind of jerks you out of the moment a little bit by noticing that little bit of clear fakeness whereas in cgi everything's consistent everything's operating under the same rules and you're not going to have those moments and so i think having that medium between like pure anime pure anime zaniness to be perfectly honest and then live action kind of toned down for real physics kind of a deal which let's be honest things that utilize the force should not be hindered by what you can do behind a camera there's so much untapped potential in terms of what you can do with the force that i think would be properly utilized in cgi and should be properly utilized in cgi and i really that'd be fucking amazing i would love to see that but we'll see what happens we're gonna have to if the that uh if that movie bombs they may just be like oh well fuck we tried mainline star wars only it is and that would be an absolute damn shame so you can be assured i'm gonna go see that movie regardless of whether or not it is good or bad i'm gonna go see it and i'm gonna support it and hopefully it isn't terrible and it doesn't lead to terrible things I would hate to support terribleness, but I've done it before. Anyway, um, what was next? LeBron James, mostly specifically, that's what I actually wrote down. LeBron James plus competitiveness, question marks. I wasn't sure if I wanted to talk about it. So, in the NBA Finals, it was the Golden State Warriors against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Golden State Warriors coming off of a historic season, a record-breaking season. The best record prior to their season was 72-10, and 10, which was the Chicago Bulls, uh, the Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Steve Kerr era, which is kind of amusing that Steve Kerr, who was on that Chicago Bulls team, is the head coach of the team that breaks that record. I can't remember what year it was in, but obviously the Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Steve Kerr, um... I think there was a guy named Tony something in there. Uh, what the fuck? Dennis Rodman. I wanted to call him Rob Hodman or something like that in my head. And I was like, that's not fucking right. Dennis Rodman. Iconic team. Legendary team that like, even if you have not, even if you don't really care about basketball, you know about the Chicago Bulls. Um, but so the Golden State Warriors came off of a season where they beat their record. They went 72 and 9, I want to say. 73 or something like that. But they had an iconic season, and they were looking unbeatable. And then they hit the semifinals, the conference finals, because you have the Western Conference and the Eastern Conference. So they hit the Western Conference finals, 
And suddenly they looked beatable. Suddenly they were looking bad. They barely scratched through. And honestly, it was more of a failing of the other team to not close it out than it was like a pure win from Golden State's uh, standpoint. On the flip side of that, you have Cleveland, who had been doing exceedingly well throughout the entire finals. And then you hit it. And Golden State destroys them twice in a row. Pulls out, uh, I think they lost the third game, won the fourth game. And then from then on, everything just went to shit. And the only thing I could think of the entire time was Cleveland wants this more. Cleveland is playing harder. They're trying harder. They're making more of an effort on a consistent basis off of every single possession than Golden State is doing. And then you also have to add in the fact that, you know, like there were some times where just LeBron James could not miss a goddamn shot. He was sinking the most absurd shots ever. Whereas on the flip side, you have players like Klay Thompson and Stephen Curry who are known for being legendary shooters and being the reason why that team is such a threat is because they can just pull up from like 10 feet behind the three-point line and just drain a three. And that's something that's really kind of unheard of and not common. And they couldn't make a goddamn thing. They just started missing significantly more than they ever had before. And so all I could think of that entire time is just watching Cleveland play and seeing the difference in effort, seeing the difference in willpower, and just thinking, Cleveland's going to win this because they want it more. And that's what I wanted to talk about. That's what I wanted to tie into fighting games is that talent can only take you so far. That's something that a lot of players have discussed before where if you just have raw talent but you don't really sit down and grind it out just you know hammer that talent into a precision weapon through you know grinding out training mode or grinding out matches all day long basically treating it like a full-time job in order to hone your skills talent's only going to take you so far so talent plus effort is going to take you even further it's going to bring you to the upper echelon of the competitive community but even that's not enough you have to have that utter competitive desire, that complete and total singularly focused drive to see this thing happen to get there. And there are a lot of people that, you know, they're really good players and they're just like, hey man, you know, it's just a fun time. I love I love being part of this community. I enjoy competing and it's just fun. You know, I really enjoy it. And then you have the people that are like, fuck you, fuck everybody else. I'm the fucking best. I'm going to continue to be the best and can't nobody stop me nobody can stop me on my road to proving that I am superior to everybody the drive you have to have that if you want to compete and you want to win it's not enough to just be talented it's not enough to just practice it's not enough to combine the two you also have to have that competitive drive that urge to excel that is so very important and so that's what you know arguably the Golden State Warriors were the far better team they should have won, but they lacked that utter emotional drive that would push them along, you know, when they're at their the edge of their desire, of their willingness to continue on, that bit of heart is what pushes you further on, that desire to succeed, that desire to win, and that's not to say they didn't have it at all, but you see LeBron James out there getting incredibly frustrated at mistakes hyping his team up through various plays that he didn't need to do he didn't have to attack with the ferocity he did and he could have conserved that energy but he knew his team needed it he knew that his team would be amped up by him being energetic and thus he expended every scrap of possible effort that he could in order to make sure his team followed behind him and that is what you fucking need if you want to succeed at a competitive level. And that's why I've stated before that no matter how much time I put into fighting games, no matter how good I get at a particular fighting game, I will never be at the top level of that fighting game because despite the fact that, again, I obviously I greatly enjoy fighting games. I've been playing them for a long time now and I've tried to get at least fairly decent, be able to hold my own with the top level of players in it and you know so i can have interesting matches with them but i'm never going to be the best i will never be the best because i have never felt that competitive drive while playing fighting games never not once have i ever been like now in individual matches it can kind of flash up momentarily to be like fuck that i am not losing to this person i am not going to go out like a bitch in this match i am going to destroy this dude 
There are brief flashes of it. But it's not there consistently. It's not there after the match is over. It's not there after the tournament is over, driving me forward and urging me to grind out my execution so I don't struggle with instant air dashes. So I don't drop a combo 5% of the time. So, you know, like to perfect everything, to again, hone my abilities to a razor's edge. That drive isn't there. And it has to be. So that's why I wanted to talk about it. Is so, you know, like if you have people that are like, what can I do in order to improve? You have to get invested. You have to care. Pure and simple. There's only so much that like a clinical detachment from everything and anal- looking at everything from an analytical point of view can get you. There's only so far you're going to go. You have to have that fury at the prospect of losing that pushes you forward and makes you better. You have to have that pride on the line. Because if you don't have your pride on the line, ultimately you don't care about the match. And if you don't care about the match, then whatever. The outcome's just whatever. So, yeah. If you want to get better, start caring. Pure and simple. Um, so, mighty number nine. Obviously, the problems that this game has had since it got kickstarted, very well known. I'm not going to go into the whole process. Basically, a uh, very overly summarized version Kaiji Inafuni. People have been clamoring for a Mega Man game. People have been clamoring for just Mega Man to make appearances and things. And then Capcom trolled the fuck out of their community by doing box art Mega Man and, Mega Man and Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Uh, they put Zero in Marvel vs. Capcom 3, but not Mega Man. And then they gave Zero an alternate costume of Mega Man, um, of X specifically. Uh, what have they done? Anything they have they've done a lot of merchandising surrounding Mega Man, but they've never they haven't given him a new game, and they haven't really given him the respect his series sort of deserves, due to how iconic the series has become in the hearts of its fans. And so obviously everybody feels that Capcom has mistreated the character, mistreated the product, and they want to see somebody do it better. In comes Kaiji Inafuni, the original creator of Mega Man saying, hey, look at this. It's Mega Man, but it's not Mega Man. It's close enough, right? It's basically the same. I'm the creator. I can do something that's faithful to the original product without infringing on copyright. Check this shit out. And everybody checked it out, and everybody was like, oh my god, this artwork looks amazing. I want it. I want it so bad. After I finish fapping real quick, I will donate money to this Kickstarter! And they did. And it became a massively successful Kickstarter. And then he started another Kickstarter. And people went, wait a minute, what? You, you haven't even shown us anything about Mighty Number no. 9 yet. How are you going to start another Kickstarter? And that failed spectacularly. And that's when everybody started to question. Started to be like, okay, wait a minute. What's going on? And then delays happened. And then people started seeing actual gameplay. And they were unimpressed. The engine was nowhere near as pretty as the artwork was. Um, it didn't look particularly polished. And then it got delayed again. And then after those delays happened the original time... Inafuni comes out and is like, hey man, I want to put this stuff into the game as well. So we're going to have to delay it in order to account for our ability to do that. And so on and so forth. And then out came a trailer. Let me actually see if I can find this really good. It should still be in my search history. Is this one it? Mighty Number no. 9 Masterclass? I remember there's two. Yep, Deep Silver. Holy shit! 1,035,836 views. 4,372 likes. Now, depending upon how many views a trailer or a video in general can get, it can vary wildly what like an acceptable like ratio in or in uh, accounting to views. Like dislikes sort of matter, but ultimately it's how many likes you get in comparison to how many views you got. And when it comes to get, uh, videos below, like, probably around 100,000, you want to be looking at about a 1 out of every 10 views gets a like. Above that, you start getting repeated viewings counted. You start getting people that just noticed it on their sidebar as something that's hot and new, and they check it out, but they're not interested, and they just bail. And so the ratio goes down a bit further the more views you get. Now, a 4%... I'm sorry, not a 4%, that's less, that's a 0.4%. 4,372 likes in comparison to 1 million views. Ouch. To begin with, ouch. 
But the dislikes. 34,000 dislikes. Youch. That means there's about a 1 to 9 like to dislike ratio. Yow. And the trailer was painful. It was very cringy. It had it looked bad. It was bad and Sonic the uh a tweet regarding Mighty Number no. 9 blew the fuck up. Uh they changed the background and explosion to look like pizza. To actually no, I'm sorry, not to look like pizza because it already looked like pizza. They changed an explosion in the background to actually be pizza slices and honestly you couldn't really tell the difference. Uh and they bl- the Sonic Twitter page which is actually pretty damn good. Like whoever runs that should just make them run the company. They have far better ideas and a far better sense of humor than everybody else in that company. Just let that person go nuts and let's see what happens. It can't get worse. So fuck it, let's see what happens. But anyway, Mighty Number no. 9. Um obviously that trailer got some negative feedback a little bit. And then people started seeing gameplay and people started seeing the engine and it's just everything has gone downhill since then. And then they made the mistake of doing a live stream of the game. I can't remember if it was like during the end parts of E3 or after E3. But this golden fucking line came from it. I don't know who the person was that said it, but Kaiji Inafune was directly fucking next to him. Sitting right next to the person that said this. And he didn't chime in. He didn't com- comment on it at all. He just sat in silence. It isn't perfect. But at least it's better than nothing. In regard to Mighty Number no. 9. Is that the fucking quote? you want to hear from somebody at least somewhat associated with the development of a game at all do you want somebody with that mentality creating a game that you are looking forward to never never do you want to hear anything but i'm gonna make the best fucking game of all time they may fail it's probably best to just keep your damn mouth shut because that has ruined many a developer before where they, again, I mentioned it in regard to like Watch Dogs or Peter Molyneux in general. Uh, there have been numerous games that have been hyped up as high as it's really possible to hype a game up. And there's no way for that game to live up to the hype. They built up expectations too high and they just can't meet them. It just That's very simple. It's going to happen. So generally, you want... But you still want somebody who is very confident and is very capable i suppose is on top of that obviously that confidence needs to have developed from something regarding their ability uh but to hear anybody say eh, at least it's better than nothing no something that lessens your opinion of a developer of a game of a concept of com of a concept because <laughs> concept is the name of his company okay uh Anything that lessens your opinion of that is harmful. And it's not better than nothing. You would have been better just sitting along this line of no opinion whatsoever in regard to your product. Because nobody knows anything about what you're doing, what, you, what you're aiming for, what you're trying to do. In comparison, now you're underneath that line. Now people have no faith in you. Now people don't believe you're capable of making a good game. So hell no, it's not better than nothing. You fucking idiot. You just, even if you make the most amazing game in the world as a follow-up, you just lost faith. Everybody just lost faith in you. And your sales will suffer because of that. So, the dude that said that, I don't, again, I could have, I probably could have looked up his name and found it fairly simply, but I didn't feel like it because honestly, I don't want to, I don't want somebody like this getting attention and feeling like they should be talked about, at least by name. Uh, fuck that dude. That's ridiculous. That is such a shitty mentality to ever have when you are de- you are a developer of something that you want people to buy. And that immediately right there. Now, I have not... I did not get in on the Kickstarter. I don't get in on Kickstarters. I have no faith in them whatsoever. Obviously, there are plenty of good stories surrounding Kickstarter. So, I'm not saying, you know, if you do them, you're setting yourself up for failure or anything like that. And obviously, there are also safeguards in place where if something does crash spectacularly you're gonna get you should get your well do you get your money back if i know you get your money back if the project was not successfully funded i know that but if the project does get successfully funded 
and they move forward with development, but then they fail. Do you get your money back then if they don't if you don't get the product they promised or is it like once the thing is once the actual product is uh shit what am I what what word am I looking for whatever once the product is paid for once it meets its uh goals its funding there we go once it's funded is your money gone at that moment regardless of whether or not the product gets delivered to you as promised I, that part I don't actually know um, but so yeah I mean obviously there are safeguards in place where generally if something fails you will not be harmed for it uh, but that being said I still even if a product is delivered that doesn't mean it's going to be good and that's what's happening with Mighty Number no. 9 everybody that fell for the hype you know what another one is Shenmue I don't know if it still remains the highest grossing Kickstarter of all time after all this time, but Shenmue 3, again, was funded rapidly, very quickly, reached the highest grossing uh, amount that has ever been seen on Kickstarter before, and as far as I'm aware, there's been radio silence ever since. Well, I mean, not ever since, ever, uh, ever since the creator of Shenmue came out afterwards and said... I mean, this amount is great and everything, but it actually it's really not enough for what I want to do. And then everybody kind of took a step back and was like, shit, what did we just get ourselves into? Um, so we'll see what happens. But yeah, like I said, as far as I'm aware, there has been radio silence on that front ever since that game got funded. I haven't, maybe on the Kickstarter page itself, there's been updates and stuff, but as far as like news coverage or media appearances in general is i'm pretty sure there's been nothing so that's kind of scary but uh yeah mighty number no. nine is a very harsh lesson to have to learn and one that isn't really going to be followed let's be honest people are going to have success in kickstarter early access stuff that's all going to remain successful because people are notoriously incapable of not falling for hype and I mean sure there's that level of disappointment but then you have all these negative emotions swirling around then you go look at something else and all of a sudden you feel hype again you want something to replace that negativity and now you have positive feelings toward this other project that has potential who knows if the developers are capable of meeting that potential but it looks good so fuck it let's go for it um yeah I <laughs> Who knows? Maybe Mighty Number no. Nine will actually come out, and all of the trailers will have done it no justice. Everybody that played it before just sucked terribly and had no idea what they were doing, and this came away with a negative impression. And it's gonna wind up being the deepest, most amazing game ever released, now and in the future. And we're all gonna have eggs on our faces for daring to criticize. That's not gonna happen. But who knows? It might. And that's why people. People are gamblers. There's a reason why casinos are one of the most uh, successful businesses ever created. People gamble. People believe that they are going to get the best outcome, even though statistics may not support it. Look at the amount of failed athletes there are. Look at the amount of failed actors there are. All these things where you're basically reaching for the stars, you're reaching for the upper echelon of like monetary gain and they fail spectacularly it happens it happens a lot and it's the same thing people want to hope people create expectations for the best possible outcome and then they come to believe that that's what's going to occur when the chances of that are just not they're not high they may even be non-existent but in general they're just they're not exactly probable and that's what happens with Kickstarters. You see something, you see a concept, and you go, fuck yes, this is going to be amazing. But there's no proof that it's going to be amazing. There's no proof that it's even going to be just good. There's just proof that it might be. And people really want that might to happen, but more often than not, it doesn't. And that's the... I guess that just makes me a pessimist by nature. But I am always very wary about things that could be great, but haven't shown anything great yet. So we'll see what happens. But, you know, obviously you never want something to fail outright. You're never hoping 
that something, well, there are actually plenty of people that hope something bombs. Street Fighter V is obviously a very easy example to look at. People were desperately hoping that that would just fail and go up in a fiery conflagration. I don't actually know if that's how you pronounce that word. But basically, just a gigantic explosion, and everything blows up in Capcom's faces, and they go bankrupt, and they lose all their IPs, and everything goes wrong, and thousands of people are out of a job, and hoorah! Right? That's what the internet wanted? Good people, the internet. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, thank you for listening. Peace out.